Welcome to Taking Control of Your Financial Life podcast, providing the simple answers to the complex questions asked about your financial future. Let's get you the answers you need about retirement, investing, asset planning, and the current market. Here's your host, Julian Rubenstein. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Taking Control of Your Financial Life. My name is Julian Rubenstein, and I'm the host of this podcast. I'm also the president of American Asset Management, a registered investment advisor located in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm very excited about today's show as we're fortunate to have Hillel Presser of the Presser Law Firm with us as our guest today. So please join me in welcoming Hillel to the podcast. Hello, Hillel. Hi, thanks for having me today. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, busy schedule that is, to be here. Um, and we, you know, we chatted before we got on online here that you specialize in asset protection, I uh, will hang, uh, can't see, but you've published two books. So with that said, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your law firm? Sure. Well, uh, you know, essentially we specialize uh, in asset protection and uh, we have a nationwide practice based in Boca Raton, Florida. However, we have clients uh, all over uh, the country, all different states and uh, different countries as well. And we specialize both in domestic and asset protection. So long story short, people work very hard for what they have. It's not my job to make them richer. I want to make sure that they don't become one penny poorer. Okay. I like that, right? It's important. You earn it, but then keep it. So let's talk about it, because especially Florida, it's a very litigious state, right? I mean, people like to sue for everything. I'm told I have some of the highest property claims in the country. At least that's what my condo board tells us. Um, What are some of the strategies you uh, tell people to employ to force asset protection? Sure. So there's so many different strategies and, you know, we don't believe in doing any cookie cutter work. Uh, so we take a very comprehensive uh, planning and, and consulting and architectural approach. I want to make sure that uh, everyone's plan is individualized and customized and tailored, you know, to their personal and business needs. Uh, you know, someone may be, uh, you know, protecting against a, a teenager uh, driving their car, others against a third marriage. Um, and, and you're going to do those in different ways. But there's so many different strategies. You know, all in all, we always want to tell our clients to essentially own nothing but control everything. Own nothing but control everything. And the reason being is that if you own something, it's yours to lose. So I don't want to own anything because I don't want to lose it. I worked hard. I don't want to start all over. So own nothing, control everything. I love that. So, I mean, that sounds perfect. But how do you accomplish that? Sure. So again, there's so many different strategies. Um, you know, some of the most common strategies, uh, probably one of my favorites, are transferring assets into protective entities. So to oversimplify it, if you think about it, um, if you have a vacation home uh, in your name and you get sued, you can lose that vacation home. If you have a rental property in your name and somebody gets injured on the rental property, well, they can sue you because you own that rental property. But if instead you take that asset, that piece of real estate, the vacation home or the rental property, and you transfer it out of your name into a protective entity, it's no longer yours to lose. So there's so many different types of protective entities, right? There's LLCs, there's limited partnerships, there's corporations, there's trusts. And again, there's no one size fits all. But it's really the coolest thing in the world because just like you and I are different people, we have different social security numbers. If I get sued, you don't get sued. If you get sued, I don't get sued. You and your protective entity are different living individuals. You have a social security number, your protective entity has a different tax ID number. So the law looks at you as two totally separate people. And if you take those same two examples with the vacation home and the rental house, if the vacation home is in your name and you get sued, you can lose it. But if instead you put the vacation home in a protective entity, well, if you get sued, it's not yours to lose, so you don't lose it. And if you take that rental property and you put it uh, in your name and somebody gets injured on the property, they can sue you, come after anything and everything you own, your money, your business, your boat, your plane, et cetera. But if instead you take that rental property and put it in a protective entity, well, now if somebody gets injured on the property, they cannot sue you. They can only sue that protective entity. So, you know, again, so many different strategies, but I love uh, protective entities, probably one of my favorite strategies. Right. And how do you, though, when you transfer something to an LLC, how do you still control it? Right. Because I thought if you control the LLC, it's not really considered, you know, not part of your property. 
So no, not at all. So again, depending what state you're in, things are different. But uh, if we're talking Florida, uh, you'll have what's called a manager-managed LLC. That means anybody can own the LLC. I can own the LLC. You can own the LLC. Another company can own the LLC. However, if I'm the manager, uh, I'm the one who controls it. So own nothing, control everything, take that piece of property out of your name so you don't own it, put it in the LLC, or whatever the protective entity is. I'm just using the LLC as example. But if you're the manager of the LLC, you control it as if you owned it without the actual ownership. I see. That's interesting. So then if they sue the individual and they get, well, you're saying there's nothing to sue them for, right? I see. Because the asset's not, it's not in their name. Yeah. And the goal with asset protection is essentially take your chips off the table. You want to make it so difficult, so expensive, if not impossible for anybody to collect against you that they don't want to sue you in the first place. You don't want to be the low hanging fruit. If they do sue you, you want to be able to settle the case for, you know, five, 10, 15 cents on the dollar. So the whole point of asset protection is to make yourself uncollectible and judgment proof. And that way you're not even a good candidate to be sued. You know, nobody wants to sue you if they can't collect against you. And I guess the same holds true for your liquid investments or stocks and bonds. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what the asset is. So if you have uh, stocks, bonds, brokerage accounts, CDs, money markets, any liquid assets, again, if those liquid assets are in your name, if you get sued, you can lose them. But again, if you take them out of your name, where, of course, they're subject to a lawsuit, and you put them into some sort of protective entity, then no one can touch them. So you might take your liquid assets and you may put them in a trust. You may take your liquid assets and put them in a limited partnership. You may take your liquid assets and put them in an LLC. Again, there's no one size fits all, but the main goal and the core between it is get it out of your name where it's unprotected and into some sort of protective entity where no one can touch it. And what that uh, protective entity is just depends on the person. Interesting. Don, just to digress a little, um, what made you get into this type of law? What you're sure, so, into it? Yeah, if you asked me when I was 10 years old what I was going to be, I, I would have told you hands down I was going to be a lawyer. And with that being said, I always loved business. So my whole life, I knew I was going to be a lawyer. And my whole life, I loved business. And asset protection is really the perfect marriage of business and law. And, you know, most of my clients, not all of them, uh, you know, tend to be the business owner. Um, that, that ends up being about 80% of our clients. Uh, and I met a mentor, you know, gosh, a very, very long time ago, he was one of the grandfathers of asset protection. And uh, he had done asset protection for people in my family. And long story short, uh, I bothered him uh, until he would hire me. Uh, you know, he said he wouldn't hire me. He said I couldn't work for free. Um, you know, not that I wasn't good, but he just didn't need anyone. So, uh, you know, I said, okay, no problem. I'll hire you. Uh, and I paid him. I became his client uh, and uh, formed this great relationship. And he ended up being a, a mentor to me, a father to me, and uh, a partner of mine. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away about uh, about 13 years ago or so. So you actually never worked for a, a, a firm. You just you really came out of law school and started your own firm. Well, no, I did work. Uh, When I first got out of law school, I was a prosecutor. um, And I did that for about a year or two because I wanted to have the ability to try cases. You know, when you're a prosecutor, you walk in the first day and they they hand you a box of, you know, 200 cases and tell you you have 40 trials coming up. So um, I started off as a prosecutor. I wanted to get that litigation experience. I wanted to get that trial experience. And then after that, I, I moved into asset protection. Got but it. I had actually I had actually been studying asset protection before that, uh, even in law school, just reading every book I can, reading every article I can, meeting everyone in the industry that I could. But uh, I just wanted to get that 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 experience. That's interesting. So I always love to ask this question. What do you wish you knew when you started that you know now? One thing. <laughs> everything. <laughs> you know, if I knew then what I know now, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't buy experience. You know, there, there's nothing you could do, uh, you know, to buy experience. And there's nothing you could do that, uh, you know, time teaches you everything. So I, I mean, my gosh, if I if I knew then what I knew now, I mean, I'd be like a, a superhero. Right. And I, 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 I can't add to that because I agree with you a thousand percent. That's interesting. What What is one thing you share with almost every client? I I probably know the answer, right? Own nothing and control everything. (laughs) 
Yeah, of course I tell people, but, you know, really the most important thing is just to educate yourself. Uh, You know, people don't wake up in the morning and expect to be sued, but there's so many lawsuits. I think last time I checked, it was something like there was 100 million lawsuits every single year. Uh, There was about a one in four chance you'd be sued in the next 12 months. And the average person and business is sued about five times over their lifetime. The stat that, that gets me the most is that you're seven times more likely to face a lawsuit than to get in a car accident. And everybody has car insurance. So the first thing I tell people is really just educate yourself and know that there are options out there that exist. Uh, Just this morning, I had a client call me, very, very nice guy, uh, came, uh, referred to me from from another client and uh, great guy, I would have been able to, I would have loved to been able to help him, but unfortunately he called me way too late. Uh, You know, lawsuits over, judgments are there, et cetera, et cetera, and there's nothing I can do. So probably just the, the biggest thing to understand is that there are things you can do there to protect your wealth, but you of course have to be proactive. Right. Makes makes a lot of sense. Um, what would you say is your unique approach to your clients that separates you from other asset protection lawyers? Sure. Well, first of all, asset protection is a very big niche. You know, there might be a hundred estate planning attorneys in every city or a hundred personal injury attorneys in every city. Uh, there's probably only a few hundred people in the country that claim they do asset protection. And of those few hundred, there's probably five or six firms that probably get 80% of the business. Um, why I think people come to us and what sets us apart is we take a more uh, 360 holistic approach. So people come to us from all across the country for asset protection. But with that being said, uh, we have estate planning attorneys, we have tax specialists, we have business succession planning specialists. So although we're always looking at asset protection, you know, first and foremost, I'm always looking at the integrated approach. So I'm looking at things from an asset protection point of view, an estate planning point of view, a tax planning point of view, a business succession planning point of view, a financial planning point of view, an accounting point of view. And the point is, is while you're alive, you want to take your chips off the table. You want to make sure that you're uncollectible and judgment proof. But when you pass away, you also want to make sure that those assets go where you want them to go quickly, privately, less taxes and less lawyer fees. So you you, you can't just have asset protection alone on an island. Um, Also, I think a lot of people come to us just, you know, our credibility and our knowledge. Uh, I've written several books on asset protection. Um, There was a time I was giving 50 to 100 uh, paid speeches all across the country on asset protection. Uh, We helped to rewrite some of the asset protection uh, laws. Uh, I've taught uh, law. So, uh, you know, (laughs) no lack of knowledge there. Right. You know, you you said something very interesting, which I want to point out to listeners. It's also a great uh, tool for inheritance, right, to if you're over the limit to start, you know, trying to save on estate taxes using some of your structures. Am I correct? Yeah. And and you bring up two points. You you talk about inheritance and you talk about estate tax. And to me, they're different things. You know, someone will come in here with a great estate plan, like a, a will and a trust. And, you know, the will and trust may say, hey, when John Smith is 30, he gets a third. When he's 40, he gets a third. Well, what if when John Smith is 30, he's going through a divorce? Well, you just lost half of that third. What if at age 40, John Smith's being sued for a car accident? You just lost half of that third. So when it comes to inheritance, you know, you need to make sure that you have all the asset protection clauses built into the estate planning. And you can fix that with a few words. You know, maybe instead of when John Smith is 30, he gets a third. Maybe when John Smith is 30, the trustee shall consider giving him a third. You know, those two words shall consider, take it from an estate plan with no asset protection to an estate plan with asset protection that can literally save everything. Um, In regards to the estate taxes, absolutely. You know, everyone pays a lot of taxes, obviously, when they're alive and they make money. Um, You know, people try their best to, of course, legally and ethically not pay any or pay as much as possible when they pass away. And there's a lot of things you can do where asset protection is integrated, again, with the estate plan and the tax plan and et cetera, where you can get assets out of your name for estate tax purposes, but again, not lose control. That way you don't have to answer to your kids, you know, for a slice of pizza because you've given them everything while you're alive. Yeah, I've heard about that. But right? you're saying that you take the money out of your estate, but you but you maintain control so you can use it for income if you need it. And you don't have to go to your kids and beg and borrow. 
Yeah, and it's not as simple as that, and it's not even necessarily that you can use it for income, um, but there are very, very um, uh, specific ways. You know, one example, and again, there's so many different ones. Uh, someone may set up a limited partnership. Uh, the limited partnership maybe has a general partner that controls the limited partnership. Uh, the limited partnership then may be filled with assets. Uh, someone then may gift the ownership interest, the limited partnership interest uh, that they own in the limited partnership, maybe to trust for their kids so it's outside of their estate. But as long as they retain that general partnership interest, they still have control over the limited partnership and thus have control over the assets of the limited partnership. So again, there's no one size fits all. And you know, you probably need a lot more time to explain it, but there's definitely things you can do from an estate tax purpose uh, play as well. Right. And the easy one, I guess, in Florida is we tell everyone at least start with joint tenants in the entirety <laughs> to, to make it simple, right? Let's get, let's, that's probably the first thing to do, correct? Yeah, tenancy by entirety exists in about 25 different states. Obviously, as you mentioned, Florida is one of them. Um, things to note is they're only for a married living couple. Right. So if there's a divorce, you cannot have it. If there's a death, you can't have it. But if you are, are married and living, um, it's a great thing to have. It doesn't cost you a penny. And essentially what tenancy by entirety states is that the assets of both spouses are not subject to the creditors of one spouse. So a good example is if a husband has 100,000 in his account and a wife has 100,000 in her account, if the husband gets sued, he loses the 100,000. If the wife gets sued, she loses the 100,000. If the husband and wife instead take their money and put it in a joint account, so now they have one joint account with 200,000 and it's labeled by uh, tenancy by entirety. Now, if the husband gets sued, they can't take anything. Now, if the wife gets sued, they can't take anything. They can only go after those assets if both the husband and wife are sued, which normally doesn't happen. Normally one is sued in business, another is sued uh, for a car accident and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I make a little joke and my wife tells me I only married her to get the uh, tenancy by entirety protection and you know she may be accurate you know i heard something that you have to be careful with your car insurance with tenants in the entirety if you own the car it yourself yeah so I so car cars are really important and, and it's not really more the insurance more than it is the titling uh, obviously the biggest lawsuit you see are car accidents and they're really easy to evolve or to uh to um get away from and here here's how if you have a car it should only be titled to the primary driver so if a husband has a car that he drives 80% of the time, it should be in his name and his name alone. If the wife has a car that she drives 80% of the time, it should be in her name and her name alone. And the reason being is that if there's ever a car accident, both the driver and the owner are sued. Uh, so for example, if you have a car that's titled to the husband, but the wife or the kid are driving it, well, if the wife or kid get in a car accident, they get sued as the driver the husband gets sued as the owner. He didn't do anything. He's sitting at work. So the best way to avoid the car uh, accident lawsuits is only title the car to one person. And the one person should be who drives the car the primary majority of the time. How do you deal with that if the wife is not working? How, um, can she still like lease it? Will she have enough credit to lease the car because she's married? Yeah, presumably that's going to be fine. And worst case, if you had to sign as a guarantor on the loan, the key thing is you want to make sure you're not on the title. I see. So you let the I, that's a very good advice. I never I've never heard that. I mean, I just briefly a while ago. I'm glad you clarified that because I'm going to assume 90 percent of our listeners, the husband, not to be a male chauvinist, is on both car leases, I would gather. Yeah, and even take that a step further, you don't want your car titled to your business. Now, uh, let me preface it. I'm not talking about fleets of vehicles. If you're a builder and you have 50 cars, that's a different story. But you don't want your personal vehicle titled to your business because think about it. You go out for dinner on Saturday night, you get in an accident, your suit is the driver. Now your entire business is sued and put at risk because they're the owner of the vehicle. So I see so many business owners, they title their cars to their business because they want the expense. Well, just because it's titled to you and not your business doesn't mean you can't take the expense. It's still reasonable and ordinary and necessary, obviously, depending on how much you use it for business. But you don't ever want your primary vehicle ever titled to your business. And yeah, another caveat I learned a long time ago, it's also a lot more expensive to insure a commercial car than your own car. Right. Well, you got to love the insurance companies. I think they're one of the most profitable industries in the world. Uh, when I come back, I think I want to be them. That's true. So with all the success you have, what is your biggest challenge? 
biggest challenge is, is, is probably just, uh, you know, uh, growing. You know, uh, one of our goals and missions is to essentially passionately educate uh, all generations, you know, on wealth protection and asset protection. And, uh, you know, as a business owner, to me, uh, the toughest thing for me has always been, you know, finding and hiring uh, good people. Uh, you know, I live uh, in South Florida and a lot of people choose to come down here, not because they want to work 20 hours a day, uh, but because they want to enjoy the outside and they want to walk and bike and go to the beach, which I totally understand and respect. And, you know, I'm a big fan and a proponent of, you know, work-life balance. But, uh, you know, I always say if I can hire endless great people, you know, we would grow much more and help a lot more people. That is a challenge here. Yes, very much so. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with the uh, listeners that we haven't touched on today? No, I think we touched on a lot of great topics. Um, you know, if anybody uh, would like any more information, uh, they can feel free to go to our website. It's www.assetprotectionattorneys.com. That's www.assetprotectionattorneys.com. We have tons of great educational information. And uh, if anybody would like any of our books that we authored on asset protection, uh, I'm happy to send them complimentary copies uh, as long as they mention your show. That'd be great. Okay, well, anyway, thank you very much for being on the show. And I hopefully we'll have you back on the show. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me and uh, hope today was uh, educational, timely, and valuable. Thank you for tuning in to Taking Control of Your Financial Life. For more information about today's topics, please visit or check the show notes for more important information and links. Share, rate, and review this show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.